Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And um, I'm going to be talking about intellectual property pirates, part one. And I'll explain what we mean by that in a minute. Before I start, though, there's a couple of things I want to make sure we share with you. The first one is the slide you see here with links regarding uh, COVID-19 business resources. I recognize things are changing very fast and um, it's hard sometimes to keep up, but you really do need to uh, do that for yourself and your business. So I, I wish you the best on that. If you contact uh, the New Mexico SBDC, they will provide a copy of the presentation for you and it'll have uh, the links in it so that you can uh, access these resources. Today, we're gonna talk about intellectual property really is the big issue here. And so uh, you may think you know what it is and you probably do know a bit or a lot about intellectual property, but there are so many nuances and issues for businesses, it's really important to know what they are. So we're gonna talk about the different types of IP. We're gonna talk about how IP can protect your business and uh, your, the value of your business. And the goal here, the objectives is after this meeting to understand what IP is and how it can protect your business. And I get a lot of questions, interestingly enough, given COVID, there are some interesting nuances to that. I'm gonna address that throughout the presentation when appropriate. So intellectual property pirates, and this is part one. And I'll explain what I'm gonna cover in part one versus part two, which will uh, be this coming Thursday. But I wanna start with what is an idea? And the reason I'm starting off with this is, is I can't tell you if I got a nickel for every call I got in a week saying, I have a great idea. And then they want me, the lawyer, to sign an NDA and they haven't even hired me yet. So it seems like a lot of people think about intellectual property from an idea standpoint. And ideas are interesting. I think there's a, you know, sort of a, a positive the optimistic view of an idea, you know, everything begins with an idea, you know, Earl Nightingale, you know, Paula Poundstone had a joke regarding ideas. And that's, you know, adults are always asking little kids what they want to be. And it's because we adults are looking for ideas because ideas are, are hard sometimes. Robin Williams had a great quote here. And, um, you know, we're, the right ideas can change the world. However, I think there's, you know, sort of a pessimistic view of an idea. And that is, ideas are like elbows. Everybody has them. And um, I tried to figure out who the author was of that quote, and I couldn't figure it out. Too many people were quoting it. So I put author unknown. I'd like to find out who the author is, if any of you know that. And I really, I think in the context of business, this last quote is really the most important. The ideas are like elbows, everybody has one. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good one or it doesn't mean it's something that can be protected. And so I'm gonna give you some more, some examples of this. And um, let's look at this first. What is Google's idea, right? What is the, 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 the idea that they just had to protect and you know, save and that's why they're a billion dollar company? Well, they're a search engine. And guess what? That wasn't a unique idea when Google came out with it. There were prior search engines before Google came out. Was their idea ranking the way they rank results? Maybe. You know, was their idea their simplified homepage? Maybe. Was it the combination of things? Probably. What about this? Apple computers. What is, what is their great idea? Well, they make computers. They, they weren't the first ones to make a personal computer. And they're certainly not going to be the last or the only. So what's their great idea? The user interface, Windows, using a mouse? Maybe, but believe it or not, they weren't the first to that party either. That was Xerox years prior to Apple's first Mac. So is it the combination of stuff that they do as a company? Probably. Last one, FedEx. What is their great idea? Well, they're a shipping company. That's not, you know, new. You know, I guess maybe we could argue their great idea was is everything goes into one, you know, center, distribution center, and then it gets all pushed out. You know, okay, that's an idea. Is that, you know, the, the idea that must be patented and protected? I don't know, probably not. And it, it really, I think you can 
ask yourself, what are the common themes between these three very different companies? And I'd argue one is brand, right? The brand name. When I said these names, you instantly thought something about these companies. It gave you a warm feeling or it gave you a bad feeling. It gave you a feeling like, oh, this is what they do. That's what the brand is, the brand message and identity. We're going to talk about that a little bit. That's valuable. And guess what? That's intellectual property. Contracts. I would argue every single one of these companies has a contract of some sort or another. They're going to have contracts with third parties. Who are the third parties? They're going to be vendors. They're going to be partners. They're going to be suppliers. They're going to be you know, sales agents and referrers, contractors, employees. And so contracts are a form of intellectual property. They are an agreement between two parties and say you are or aren't going to do X or Y. And we're going to talk about that in the second part two of this series. What's another thing they probably all have? Secrets. You know, it doesn't mean dirty secrets, but it means secrets about their business. Maybe how they, you know, who their partner list is or how they handle logistics or, you know, funding or a million other things. They have intellectual property in the form of secrets. What else? Unique work product. I would argue Google, for example, has, you know, their, you know, not just their search engine, but they also have the, the Google Local, which you know they acquired. They have YouTube, they acquired, they acquired a lot of different work product, software, technology, systems that is protectable, intellectual property. Finally, I would argue they probably most have inventions, maybe not all, but um, if they do have inventions, that might be a protectable or intellectual property component of these businesses as well. So what's the point I'm trying to make? These companies, as amazing and as big and as powerful and valuable as they are, they didn't, it's not because they had one idea they had to protect. They are doing the same as all big, great, valuable companies. They have a lot of things going on and they are protecting and doing things as appropriate for the type of business that they have. So let's talk about that a little bit more in detail. So now I've just taken those general concepts and put it to this slide here. What can be protected for a business? And there's two sort of pieces to this. One is, do you have the ability to protect something against the rest of the world? And that would be these four things I've listed here. These are considered the four components of intellectual property usually. The first one is trademarks. Trademark is a source identifying mark. And we're going to go over that in part one. It identifies the company. It establishes the brand and it's protectable. And you need to understand how it protects and how it doesn't protect. Because not only do you want to protect yourself, you want to prevent pirates. You want to prevent people from infringing on your stuff as well as you don't want to infringe on anybody else. So it's important to understand how the contours of trademarks work. The next thing is copyrights. Um, we're going to explain that in part one today as well. Copyrights protect expressions, unique expression. And I know that seems like a simple concept, but it's not as simple. And we'll, we'll talk about why in a few minutes. Patents, I'm sure everybody has figured that out uh, or has heard of patents before. Patents, however, are expensive. And while that's a big industry, most small businesses do not have patents. And the reason is it's, it needs to be a unique, novel, non-obvious invention over prior art. So, you know, let's say you come up with some fancy glasses. Can you patent that? No, probably not. Because is it unique, new, and non-obvious over the prior art? Probably not. So patents are really, really hard to get. And software patents in particular, we used to see a lot of those and we still see a few of them, but they're extremely difficult to get. Finally, a lot of people overlook this and I can't tell you, it's a constant problem for a lot of uh, our clients are trade secrets. People don't understand what they are, they don't understand what they mean and they're extremely valuable and important to your business. And we're gonna talk about patents and trade secrets, not this time, but we're gonna talk about them in part two of the series. And finally, there's another aspect of intellectual property that I like to talk about, and you're not gonna see this often, 
often, but I think it's important, and that is the contract. And this, a contract, you can't enforce against anyone other than the parties to the contract that have agreed to the contract. You know, the people who have either clicked a checkbox saying, yes, I agree to the terms of service, or they've signed their name on a contract somehow with a wet signature or e-signature. And the reason that's important is, while you can't enforce the contract against non-parties, you can certainly enforce the contract against the people who've agreed to the contract. And what could be in the contract? Well, maybe you can't protect an idea with a patent, but you can protect it in a contract. So at least if you're gonna share your idea, your concept with others, you'd use an NDA, for instance, a non-disclosure agreement. But that's not necessarily where you can stop that. You know, you could protect your ideas and concepts and your business processes and customer lists and everything with contracts with your employees and your contractors and so on. So we're gonna spend a little more time on that, but again, in part two of the series. So I'm gonna spend the next 45 minutes, maybe not that long, maybe um, you know, 40, 35 to 40 minutes talking about trademarks and copyrights. And the reason I'm doing that is because every business has this issue and patents, trade secrets, they're a little more esoteric. Contracts are really important. I wanna spend a lot of time on that. And I wanna give it the, due, the time that it's due. And that's why I wanna put that in part two. So let's talk about trademarks briefly. And I'm gonna give you trademarks 101 on the call. Trademarks are critical because they can help associate a thing, a word, a logo, a color, a sound to your product or service. I'm just gonna ask you a quick question and think about it. Can a slogan be used as a trademark? You know, interestingly enough, my competition on the internet, you can go and pay the money and file a trademark for a slogan. But the short answer is no, a slogan is not trademarkable. And why would my competition say, hey, you can apply your slogan for a trademark? Well, because, you know, it's not their fault the USPTO doesn't accept it. The bigger issue is, is it being used as a source identifier for a product or a service? So I just threw up the golden arches, right? You know instantly who that is, don't you? And you know in your head what kind of food it is. And some people really like it, some people don't, but that's okay. That's what the brand is. That logo, that right there, that golden arch is everything you need to know about a trademark. And what about this? You know, what comes to mind when you see that? That's what a trademark is. What is that? I mean, it's just a swoosh, right? That little tiny mark has so much meaning. And interestingly enough, do you know how much that mark is worth? It's in the billions with a B, a simple little mark like that. So why, why do we care about trademarks? Because it establishes a unique identifier to your product or service, number one. And two, it adds tremendous value to your business if you do it correctly. What about that? Now, this was a little hard for me to find, by the way, but if, you, if you're thinking Coca-Cola, you're right. Coca-Cola actually started, you know, using the shape of the bottle as a form of a trademark for its product, as well as the color red, by the way. That color red is a big issue now for Coca-Cola. Just do it, right? We know Nike, right? Now, how about this? The Amazon smile. And do we all know what that is? Target. And then green on a garbage truck for crying out loud. That's a protectable thing. And when you see a green garbage truck, it means waste management. Finally, pink, the color pink for insulation. You know, it is a co own, uh, uh, owns corning product and you're not gonna find any, other, any insulation that is that color pink. And that is a protectable thing that they've used. Trademarks are used to identify the source. And you can think of trademark law is trying to protect the public. We don't want somebody else using the golden arches and buying food product that isn't McDonald's. And if you think about it, McDonald's doesn't want that because suppose they don't provide great food or suppose somebody gets sick, they're still gonna sue McDonald's 
even if they weren't at McDonald's because they remember the golden arches where they ate and they got themselves sick. So trademarks are really important to identify the product source or the source of the service. And, and then it associates the whole brand and meaning behind all of that. So, so there are some really important concepts here you need to understand about trademarks. And one is the likelihood of confusion standard. Likelihood of confusion means that is the use of a mark likely to confuse somebody as to who is providing the product or service? And so it's the standard isn't an exact match, not a direct hit. It's a similar, what is similar? And so it's important for you to understand that. And similarity relies on look, sound, or meaning. It could be any one of them. It doesn't have to be all of them. There's many other rules, by the way, around trademarks. And the big one that gets people is descriptiveness. And I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. But descriptiveness really gets a lot of people because we want to name our companies what they are. So Albuquerque's best hamburgers for a hamburger state. Well, guess what? That's descriptive. And you can't trademark that. When the, uh, I gave you the examples of Apple and Google and uh, FedEx, do any one of those names describe what they do? No. Amazon? No. Does, does pink describe insulation? No, of course not. So you want to be on the right-hand side of this spectrum that I have. Arbitrary. You have an arbitrary name. Let's say I'm going to pick on peach. What does peach mean other than fruit? So you could use something like peach for accounting software or peach for motorcycles. That would be an arbitrary designation of the word. And that makes a really great trademark. On the flip side, if it's right out of the dictionary, you have an elevator company and you want to name it elevator company. Well, guess what? That's generic. That's descriptive you cannot trademark it. So there's a there's sort of this blurry line between descriptive and arbitrary called suggestive. That's where you want to be if you're not going to be arbitrary. And I'll give you an example of suggestive. Greyhound bus. So greyhound, what does that imply? You know, sleek, fast, bus or bus company. So that would be the, the bus doesn't really matter for the trademark. It'd be the Greyhound. And that would be, I would argue, suggestive for you know, what Greyhound bus does. You don't want to be in the descriptive category. That was descriptiveness. But we also care about other marks in the marketplace. And we care about what those other marks are doing in the marketplace. So first is, do we have a likelihood of confusion with anybody else? If so, we're gonna have a problem. If not, let's get the trademark. Now, is somebody else using our mark in a confusing way? And if so, then we need to take action. And so that is another issue with trademarks is you have to police it. You have to make sure other people aren't using a confusingly similar mark to your mark. And so similarity means sound, look, or meaning. And then there's also commercial impression. And, um, that is an interesting one as well. Um, I won't dive into that too much, but I'll have a couple of examples in a moment. But the, you look at the similarity of the mark, and then you look at the similarity of the product or service. And remember, similarity in meaning. So if I have the word red, and somebody else uses the word rojo, is that similar? You bet your butt it's similar because it has the same meaning. Translations mean the same thing in trademark law. So do synonyms. And I'm going to go through some other examples in a moment. But on the product and service side, that's been really confusing for people. We've seen instances where the US Patent and Trademark Office, as well as trademark holders have related coffee and donuts. I mean, in my mind, they're two very different things, but 
the commercial impression, you know, you're going to find really good coffee in a donut shop in theory and vice versa. And so even though they're different products, they could be viewed as a similar product for trademark purposes. We've seen the USPTO relate perfume and sun tanning lotion, coaching and consulting, websites versus retail stores, expensive watches and luxury cars. Now, isn't that ridiculous? You'd have like expensive watches and luxury cars. Why would they be considered similar from a product perspective? The answer is because you probably have the same types of folks purchasing both. And so you're gonna be going after the same groups of people and that may be enough to trigger similarity from a product or service perspective. But let's talk about similarity from the word perspective, the mark, not the actual product or service. I mentioned synonyms. So box and cube would potentially be considered the same thing. Abbreviations like lux and luxury, those are gonna be considered similar or same for trademark purposes. I mentioned the translations. Words and made up words can be considered similar as well. Like, you know, the, uh, it seems like the millennials nowadays, they text everything and they will abbreviate the A-T-E in a word using the number eight. Those would be considered the same or similar. Common words found in a similar industry, even though they're different words. Athletics in running could be viewed as the same thing if we are selling athletic wear, for instance. They could be viewed as very different things if we are selling computers. Different forms of the same word, adaptive versus adapt uh, is an example, but you can imagine many other combinations of that. The other thing you need to know is that the first word is given importance. So if there was a company out there that was called adaptive and you wanted to have a company called adapt athletics and more, that's not gonna fly and vice versa. If you knew there was a company out there called adapt athletics and more, and you wanted to have a company called adaptive in the same or similar product or service category, you're gonna have a problem with that as well. The first word is given prominence. I, 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 I'm not kidding. I've had people call me saying, well, you know, I know Google's a famous mark, so I don't want to use Google. I'm going to use, I'm going to pluralize. I'm going to call it Google's and I'm going to say, you know, training in computers by Google's. And, and I'm, I don't remember exactly what it was. I just made that up and I don't like the example, but it, it's similar to what I had one guy ask me. And whether it's Google or Google, Google's, doesn't matter at all, right? Still sounds the same, looks the same, has the, pretty much the same meaning. So pluralizing something is not gonna make a difference. And the other thing is Google, that's its only word. It's its first word. So it has a lot of prominence and simply throwing other words in front of it isn't gonna get around the issue with the Google. Plus Google's a famous mark. So don't try it. You're just gonna end up throwing a bunch of money at somebody like myself, the lawyer trying to defend you and will lose. So then you're gonna be wasting your money, so don't do it. Other issues, additional words may not be enough. And I kind of just mentioned that with the Google, uh, children's learning in Google Play. I should have advanced this one more and I would have had that example. But this is not gonna get you out of getting in trouble with Google. And then finally, I want you to understand that descriptive terms, pretend they're not there when you're looking at trademarks. So if I had a company, Larry's Fast Machine Learning, for an AI company or a computer company dealing with machine learning, then those descriptive terms are just gonna fall off like they don't exist when we're comparing trademarks. So those are not distinguishing characteristics. And if somebody else has the word Larry's in their computer company, I'm probably gonna have a problem unless I add more descriptive terms so that I don't look as similar to the other trademarks out there. And so I know this is a lot, but I hope I'm proving the point here that for you to understand similarity and how that applies to trademarks. And so why do we care about that? Well, you need to find a good brand for your business. Why? Because that's what people remember.
that's what people shop for. So if you try to name your company something descriptive, let's go with Albuquerque's Best Hamburgers again, what happens when somebody Googles that, right? They're gonna come up with a million and one hits. They're not gonna know which one of those hits is you. You're not doing yourself any favors. You need to go through the very, very difficult exercise of coming up with either a suggestive or an arbitrary name for your product, service, your company, and then you need to make sure first that nobody else is using something similar. And this is a very hard step for most people because one, you got all these issues. So you really need to do some really careful searching or you need to hire somebody to do it for you. And then the second reason this is really hard is because nine times out of 10, your first choice is gonna be close to somebody else. And then you're gonna to wanna to pay me to give you an opinion. And my opinion is gonna be like, it's close. What do you want me to tell you? It's similar, so it's risky. Will you get sued? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. You know, and, and people don't like when I say something indefinite like that. So, you know, you wanna steer clear of that sort of thing. And you wanna be not just clever once, but maybe five, 10 times and then filter out, find a mark that's available, that there are no other confusingly similar marks. Once you've found that, then you owe it to yourself to protect it by getting a federal-based trademark, and that takes time. So you wanna file it right away, go through the process, and get it awarded. And finally, you have to police it and protect it. You don't want other people using it, and you don't want other people creating confusingly similar marks against your mark because that reduces the value of your mark. It makes people confused and people might go and shop there instead of coming to shop at your business. So you really need to spend some time and effort thinking about this and you don't want anybody pirating or taking advantage of your hard work and coming up with a good brand for your business. And I, I, I'm gonna say one more thing quickly um, about the value of good branding. I had a web hosting company. It was called Fat Cat. And uh, we couldn't get the women to wear the shirts for some reason, I, I, I don't know why, but it was an interesting brand name because it was cute, it was clever, it was a hosting plan and we made it really fat by putting a bunch of stuff in it, you know, and, and um, that sold really well. We owned the domain name, we owned the trademark, we had the branding around it, we had a Primo brand tied to this. And guess what? We sold that company about, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago now. And we were paid double what a normal company goes for because it had a valuable brand attached to it. So if you are working your butt off trying to create a great company because you think someday you might have an exit, you have to have a good brand around it. It just multiplies the value of your business. So let's now switch gears and we're gonna talk about copyrights. Now I get a lot of people calling me talking about trade, they'll say, I need a trademark or a copyright, or they'll say, I wanna copyright my name. Well, I hope you now know when we're talking about business names, we're not talking about copyrights. We're talking about trademarks. Trademarks protect a brand identifier, a source identifier, so that you are protecting what looks similar to your mark. Copyrights is a completely different thing. Copyrights protect expressions. And we have this statue here of David. I apologize for the X-rated nature of the photo here, but it's a very famous photo. Everybody has seen, everybody knows. And the question I have for everybody here is, who owns the copyright of this? Now, if your mind immediately jumps to the fact it's a statue, you're in good company. However, I'm not showing you, a, this isn't a statue, is it? It's a photo of a statue. So it was a trick question because I didn't say what the this was. Well, the this is a photo of a statue. And so who owns the copyright of that photo? The photographer, right? You need to remember that. 
And this is going to be, if you understand that concept, you are now light years ahead of a lot of other business owners who end up getting into very expensive lawsuits or demands because they didn't understand that one basic concept. But let's talk about the statute. For, for this, the statue of David, it's clearly in the public domain. So it allows the photographer to take a photo. But let's, let's pretend we're back then. This is a brand new statue. Who owns the copyright of this? Well, I hope you're not getting tricked again. We're still talking about the photo, right? So the photographer owns the copyright. Maybe we really need to look at the statue first. Who owns the copyright to the statue? And your mind might come immediately to say, well, Michelangelo, if he was living, because we're, we're back then now, right? Michelangelo owns it. Uh, maybe, maybe not, right? Did, is this just Michelangelo's all by himself or did somebody hire him to do it? So that raises the question, is it the one who pays to or commissioned the work or is it the one who made the work, the author? Guess what? Answer is it depends. But there is a, a general rule and that is it would be Michelangelo who, let me go back to that. It should be Michelangelo who did the artwork except there's some exceptions to this. So what does the rights have for the one who paid? The answer is, if you paid for the statue, you have the right to that statue only to have, to hold, to sell, to transfer. That's it. You don't have any other rights. What does Michelangelo have? Michelangelo can reproduce it, make copies of it, sell those copies, transfer, distribute copies to the public, show, display, perform the work in public. Think about that for a minute. You paid for the statue, you get to put it in your you know, private library, but you don't get to display it in public. That's the way copyright law works. Most importantly, the person with the copyrights can create derivative works. And that's really, really important. Not only can Michelangelo say, I'm gonna create more of these, but what about the photograph? The photograph is a derivative work. So, well, if Michelangelo owns the copyright and I go and take a picture, I'm not allowed to actually take the picture, let alone reproduce or make copies or sell, transfer, or display publicly, or doctor up the photo. That would be a derivative work of the photo, which is derivative work of the statue. So the copyright holder owns all of that, has all the rights to that. So the general rule here, the exception is, if the author is a W-2 employee, and I used to say employee, but people would get confused between contractor and employee. People would say, well, they're a 1099 employee. No, there's no such thing as a 1099 employee. 1099s are contractors. Sure, you can call them an employee. I would recommend you don't because it can create some potential issues for you. But 1099 are contractors. W-2 paid people with withholding are employees. And only W-2 based employees, if they are creating work product for your business, does the copyright ownership automatically default to the business? Otherwise, the author owns the copyright. It begs the question, how do you obtain the copyrights from the vendors and contractors you hire? And the only way you can do that is a contract written contract, not verbal, not an email, not a promise or a pat on the butt, a written contract. And specifically, you want a work made for hire clause granting the copyrights in anything they produce for your company. And you want an assignment clause, which is a little bit of a broader brush approach saying any and all rights, interest, and ownership in the work product you produce and create for my company needs to come back to 
me, the company. And why is that important? Well, we're going to talk about some interesting things here that you, you, you could probably, you probably have connected the dots, but I'm going to do that for you because that's my job. Why do we care? What can be protected by copyright for your business? And the, the, what you would get off the copyright.gov website, the copyright office is this. Literary, dramatic, musical, artistic works, such as, but not including poetry, novels, movies, songs, computer software, architecture, expressive stuff, you know, movies, videos. What copyright does not protect are facts, ideas, systems, processes, methods, words. I can't copyright a word, let's say my company name, I can't do it. I gotta add more words to it so it becomes an actual work of authorship, like a poem. I can protect a poem, even a short poem, half a page, even a paragraph could be protectable under copyright. But what we can't do is protect words and small phrases through copyright. That won't work. We can't, you know, I can't send in a picture of a black square and try and protect black squares. I also can't protect stuff that's functional. So if I had a really unique steering wheel, I can't protect the steering wheel as a copyright. But let's say I put a really unique pattern. I can protect the pattern um, not the steering wheel. So if you had a wallpaper company and you had some unique patterns, you can protect the pattern, but you can't obviously protect wallpaper. Everybody gets to make their own wallpaper. The, the, the caveat to this is if we have a bunch of facts or a process or a system, we can write manuals, we can write books, we can protect the books. We can't protect the facts, at least not through copyrights. Finally, you know, you need to be aware when you hire people and that's how it applies to your business. So when we're talking about photos, for example, websites, web apps, software, logos, articles, written text, ad copies, blog articles, all of that stuff is expressive content subject to copyright. Videos is a big one. And there's, there's some big problems with videos I'm gonna explain in just a minute. But those are expressive things as well. And so why we care about all of that is when you hire other people to add value to your websites, your brochures, if you provide certain services or products that require expressive elements, designs, characteristics, you're getting software written for your company, all of that is copyrightable. And if your business doesn't own it, who does? The author, the contractor. And why is that important? Well, one, we talked about this, right? They can create copies. They can sell to your competitors. They can do derivative works. Now that's really critical, right? So let's, what is a derivative work? It is a work that is based on a previous copyrighted work product. So if we have a photo and we want to doctor it up, we want to blur an image, that's a derivative work. If we have a piece of software and, oh no, there's a security flaw, now we have to fix the security flaw. Guess what, folks? That security flaw, that fix is a derivative work. You don't have the right to do it unless you have permission or a license from your vendor. And guess what? Do you think all vendors are honest and unscrupulous? Or do you think there's a few vendors out there that say, well, wait a minute, we, we, didn't, you know, we didn't charge you a lot for doing the initial stuff. Now we're gonna charge you a heck of a lot to do that security fix. I see it all the time, folks. You need to be careful about that. And if you're gonna do anything at least for the love of God, get a license to create derivative works. That'll allow you to trim photos. It'll allow you to make adjustments to photos. It'll allow you to change your logo over time. It'll allow you to hire 
a different vendor to fix something if you need to down the road because the old guy or gal isn't available or charging too much, you need to have that at a minimum. So I wanna warn you about something here, and that is photos and videos. And think about my trick I did with the Statue of David. I said, you know, I showed you the picture of Statue of David and I asked you who owns the copyright. And if your mind went to the statue versus the photo, I want you to remember that trick because I was talking about the photo. Well, I wasn't, but I'm going to, I'm arguing I was talking about the photo, but who knows, right? Subject of a dispute. And when you have disputes, the only winners are us lawyers. We love disputes, love them, love fights. And that's how I put a lot of money on the table and feed my family is because of ambiguity, disputes. We, didn't, we weren't clear in the beginning. What does that have to do with photos and videos? Well, you take a photo of something and if you have a copyrightable work incorporated into that photo, guess what? You have a copyright problem because you just created a derivative work, whether you intended to or not, whether you're, there's a, it's in the background versus the foreground, it doesn't matter. Videos are worse. Videos get businesses and, and businesses into trouble all the time because they'll go and take a video somewhere in public and guess what? They captured the facade of a building that is copyrighted somehow, or there's some background music playing from the store next door. Well, guess what? You take a video of that, and if you have any background music in there, that, that is a derivative work. The video is a derivative work of the music. And so now you got a problem. And if the recording industry finds out about that video and you're using it in any way in the public, they're gonna come after you and they're gonna ask for payment of damages and fees. And, you know, not trying to scare anybody here, but we see this probably two, three times a week from various clients and the demands are anywhere from about $7,000 to $70,000 per infringing use. Otherwise, they, they, they get threatened saying, we're gonna sue you in Manhattan or Seattle or Chicago or Miami or wherever they happen to be based. Don't let that be you. So I talked about music playing in the background is probably gonna be copyrighted. And then you have other stuff, images, artwork, photos, architecture, statues. They may be copyrighted and may be issues for you. If you're a reality TV person, you may have noticed in the past when they're showing people in a restaurant or wherever, you might see stuff on the wall that's blurred out. And that's what's going on is they're blurring out the photo or the artwork because they don't want to create a derivative work and then have to go and you know, have a lawsuit on their hands or have to pay the owner of that artwork. And so you need to be aware of this. And, and I hope you're seeing something here. I hope you're understanding that you need a little bit of capability here, right? You can't just ask your niece or your nephew to do some of this because are they gonna have the wherewithal, the education, the background and experience to make sure you don't get yourself into trouble or they don't get you into trouble? Is there a particular point in time where a protected work such as music in the background become, becomes public domain? The answer is yes although it's been changing over time. And I'm embarrassed, I don't have the exact number off the top of my head because it rarely becomes an issue. It's a long period of time. Usually, well, it's, it's over 90 years. And, and I'm sorry, I don't have the exact number. That's something you can Google, but I, I'm never able to use that as a defense. Now, there are some times clients will come to us saying, hey, look, there's this authorship and you know, fill in the blank, my great grandfather did, or I've been following and has it fallen in the public domain? Can I use it? And so we have to do a little bit of research into that. And it's harder than you think because you could have an original copyrighted work that maybe was done a hundred years ago. And so that has fallen in the public domain, but people aren't looking at that original copyrighted work. They're actually looking at a derivative work which would have a new potential copyright on that. So you gotta be really careful when you're trying to say, oh, this is fallen the public domain. You need to be very, very careful. So when you are 
dealing with copyrightable material, photos, website, application, brochures, trademarks, you want to make sure you own it and you can prove it, right? The proof is hard because, you know, people will send you, okay, what do you think of this logo? Hey, it's great. Okay, we're done. No, you need to make, you know, you need something documented that you own this and, or, or you have a website and photos are incorporated. Where did those photos come from? They better not be from Google. They need to be from a, you know, your camera or their camera or a, you know, there's a number of really good, you know, places on the internet where you can buy stock photography. And if you need a list of that, talk to the SBDC folks. They can give you a list of potential vendors. But you not just want the photography from those vendors, you want a purchase receipt. You want a copy of the license that you can just throw in a folder and hopefully forget about it. But heaven forbid, somebody claims you stole their photo, you'll be able to go to that and you're gonna make my job a lot easier. And newsflash, when you hear a lawyer say, you're gonna make the lawyer's job easier, think a hell of a lot less expensive, okay? So the goal here is to not spend needless legal dollars. And so simply by filing these, these licenses away, somewhere you can get at it if you need to, is really gonna help you down the road if it ever became a problem. The other issue I want you to be aware of is, there's a lot of things we license. Uh, for instance, if you, you know, I'm just, you know, if you use the Adobe suite of products, for instance, they provide images sometimes. They have limitations, by the way, on those free images. Make sure you understand what they are and you operate within the bounds of that license. And here's something really scary. Do you think I can sell you a photo and I can say, here's what the license is? And then, can I change that license on you in a few years? The answer is yes, I can. So you wanna be really careful about it. You, you wanna document what the license is at the time you paid me so that if I say you're violating my license, go look at my website, you can say nice try, but that's not the license I purchased. And that's not the license you agreed to when I gave you the money. So you wanna copy the actual license and you wanna operate within the bounds of the license. Why? Because if you infringe on anyone's copyright, if it's properly filed within the copyright office, the fines are outrageous. $75,000 per infringing use, plus attorney's fees, collections costs, and possibly lost profits and disgorging profits. If that's not enough, I don't know what is. So you need to be careful. Finally, if you have your own copyrightable work product, register it with a copyright office. It's very inexpensive to do, very easy to do, and it only takes a few minutes. And um, I don't remember the exact fee. I always have my paralegals do this, but I wanna say it's like $35, maybe a little more per submission. And then if you have a bunch of stuff that is similar, you can call it a collection and submit the collection for, I think it's like 70 or $75, somewhere in that range. But when you file it in the copyright office, well, you probably heard of a poor man's copyright. What that means is, is anything you do, you own the copyright immediately. But when you file it, you get some special damages in attorney's fees and infringement actions. So if you have anything copyrightable, do so. Finally, remember this, the derivative works. And you wanna make sure you have the ability to do derivative works on anything you purchase, um, anything you commission somebody else to do for you. And also a lot of business owners that I deal with are very nice, they're very charitable, they're willing to let other people use stuff and that's fine, but please protect yourself and put in a little document that says what you're allowing them to do or not do. For example, if somebody really liked your logo and they wanna use it for something else, put it on a piece of paper. You can use it, but you can't create derivative works. You can't sell or transfer this to anybody else. Because if you go and give them a license to use without being specific, they can argue they had all these other rights and they can go and resell it. They can create copies 
they can create derivative works and maybe down the road that might come back to bite you in the butt. So don't let that happen. You could potentially lose the control over work product through successive derivative works if you're not careful on how you handle it. So let me give you a couple of real world examples before we exit here. And I wrote down four, depending on how much time we have. And I, I'm gonna talk about the multi-million dollar business in Santa Fe. It's really interesting about e-commerce 10 years ago, because this was still very much in, I don't wanna say debate and dispute, but I would talk to legitimate business owners in New Mexico and they would say, why on earth would I want to sell online? I'm just going to cannibalize my retail sales. Why would I do that? I think now we know that's a pretty poor, you know, sort of strategy here. And businesses that haven't adapted have created some problems. But 10 years ago, that was a big issue. Well, there was a company in Santa Fe, and I'm not, I can't mention any names, of course, but they, they said, what the hell, we'll try something. We're going to build a um, small presence online. They hired a contractor to do it. And the contractor did everything. They got the domain name. You know, they, they, they got the hosting plan. They built the website. They, they built the merchant account pieces so that they can accept credit cards. And the, the, the contractor did everything. Well, lo and behold, a few years go by and this online presence starts generating more revenue than their store, their retail store in Santa Fe. So what does that mean? Well, the online presence is extremely important, extremely valuable. And what does any good business owner do? Try to figure out how to generate more revenue and reduce costs. Well, the contractor was basing his price on sales to the point where the contractor was getting paid an absorbent amount of money. And the business made the decision to say, you know, we got to get rid of this guy. We need to bring this stuff in house and manage all this stuff ourselves. Well, uh, seems reasonable, except the contractor didn't agree. And the contractor said, nice try. This is my website. This is my, this is mine. You can't take it from me. And so they're in huge legal battle, huge dispute, lots of dollars dealing with this. And the contractor ultimately, while he wasn't entitled to use the brand name of the business, he was able to go and just basically make a copy of everything and start his own competing website and partner up with a competitor of my client. My client was hobbled with the fact that they were, they had the one website and that's it. They couldn't make any changes to it, couldn't, you know, add security fixes or anything. So basically they had to start over. And that was a very expensive proposition for them. And so don't let that happen to you. Um, I'm going to bring up Jolly Rancher and Melon Rancher really quickly. Jolly Rancher, we all know, is the candy. Melon Rancher was the name of an e-cig fluid that one of my clients had. Jolly Rancher figured that out, and surprise, surprise, Jolly Rancher wasn't happy. They said that the word rancher associated with candy-based flavors is tied to them, and they're giving their, their company a really bad rap, and they need to stop using it immediately. But Jolly Rancher wasn't happy with just them stopping using the name. They said, Jolly Rancher said, nice try. We want to know how much money you made off of this. And we want the profits because guess what? They're entitled to the profits in a trademark infringement claim. My client had 100 e-cig flavors and they don't keep track of, you know, what e-cig fluid flavors they, you know, sell or don't sell. So you know, they had a hundred flavors and, you know, they, they know what their overall company revenue is, but they don't know that, you know, three tenths of 1% is tied to the melon rancher flavor. And guess what Jolly Rancher said? Not our problem. We're going to assume it's a hundred percent of your sales. So that was a big problem for my client, as you might imagine. Unfortunately, we were able to negotiate something, but I definitely don't want your business to be in that kind of problem. And so if you're in a business where you have lots of different things, recipes, flavors, products, and you're coming up with unique names, you owe it to yourself to make sure those unique names aren't trademarked. And remember how difficult that is, right? We have the likelihood of confusion, similarity. You need to make sure that you have done that research. You're not infringing on anybody's name. 
And then if you think you might be, and you want to take the risk anyway, and I tell you, I get a lot of clients wanting to do that, keep a separate accounting so that if it ever becomes an issue, we can at least narrow the claim to that one infringing product.